Hi, I'm Jerry Ward, and I had the fortune to be the chairman of the board of Cozair Charities. Some 60 years ago, this community was haunted by the epidemic of polio. It afflicted thousands of families across our region. That is when Cozair Charities stepped up, joined with others, and led the way in eliminating that devastating disease. As we approach our 100th anniversary, we at Cozair Charities see another epidemic sweeping across this community and that is the epidemic of child abuse. And we have made a commitment to stop that ruthless plague with the same determination with which we tackled polio. Cozair Charities and our dozens of partners, which are part of the Face It movement, are going to make Louisville abuse free by 2023. When we achieve that goal, what a great 100th birthday celebration we can have. Hello, I'm Dwayne Westmoreland with Kentucky Youth Advocates. I'm sure you join Kentucky Youth Advocates in thanking Cozair Charities for initiating the Face It movement. As Jerry said, we can, we must accept no less than an abuse-free Louisville by 2023. To that end, the Face It movement is working to eliminate child abuse in ways large and small. It means training for medical professionals, child care workers, and educators. It means active involvement by young people themselves, elected leaders, the police, and the faith community. It means dozens of nonprofits making a difference every day on the front lines, and it means making a policy difference in City Hall and Frankfurt. While each of us plays a unique and different role in this campaign, one effort in which we all need to be engaged is identification of child abuse. What is not just a legal responsibility that we each have, it is a commitment of the highest order. Here to talk with us about being watchdogs around abuse is Dr. Melissa Curry, Director of the Cozair Charities Division of Pediatric Forensic Medicine at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. My name is Dr. Melissa Curry and I'm the Medical Director in Chief of the Cozair Charities Division of Pediatric Forensic Medicine at the University of Louisville. My team and I evaluate children who are suspected victims of abuse in the state of Kentucky and southern Indiana. I'm here today to talk to you about early warning signs of child physical abuse and how all of us can work together to help protect the children in our community. One of the most commonly overlooked early warning signs of child physical abuse is bruising. And so I'm going to talk about a rule that we can all learn easily and remember so that we can help decide when bruises are concerning and when bruises are just normal childhood wear and tear. I would like for you to remember the 10 bruising rule. T-E-N stands for torso, ears, and neck. Any bruising of the torso, ears, or neck in a young child is concerning for physical abuse and needs to be further evaluated. This first image shows bruising on the buttocks in a young child. The buttocks are part of the torso. The torso includes the chest, the abdomen, the back, and then the entire area that's covered by underwear. Any bruising in this distribution is concerning for inflicted injury and needs to be further investigated. The next image is of ear bruising. Studies have shown that it is actually very unusual for children to get bruises to their ears from normal childhood play. These bruises are unusual enough that when we do see them, we need to be concerned about the possibility of child abuse. The appearance of ear bruises can vary in their location, color, and size but what they all have in common is that they're part of the ear. This is a particularly helpful area to look at because in most young children, the ears are exposed and are not covered with clothing. And so even, even with casual contact with young children, um, we have the opportunity to see their ears. The next image shows bruising on the neck of a young child. So we've gone through torso, ears, and now neck. Anytime we see bruising to this protected area of the body, we need to take this very, very seriously, particularly when those bruises are somewhat round and located in this area underneath the jawline. In many children who present with this particular 
appearance of bruises, they have been a victim of abuse of head trauma. These bruises are not common from normal accidental childhood wear and tear. In addition to the torso, ears, and neck portion of the bruising rule, there's also the part of the rule that applies to babies. It turns out that studies tell us that young babies tend not to get bruises until they're developmentally able to pull up and to start taking steps along furniture. In our youngest infants, any bruising in any location on their body is cause for concern and needs to be reported promptly. Bruising in babies is never normal and it's one of the most commonly overlooked early warning signs of physical abuse. We're also going to show two different types of patterned injuries. Patterned injuries are bruises that show up on the skin that give us a clue about how they were inflicted. The two most common patterned injuries that we see in children are slap marks and loop marks. This photograph shows an example of a slap mark. Anytime we see bruises that are stripe-like, we call them parallel linear contusions. Essentially, they look like lines that are lined up and they are representing the spaces between the fingers when an open hand impacts the child. Slap marks can be easy to recognize once we have seen a few examples of them. They can occur on any part of the body, but the most common location are the buttocks or on the face, particularly the child, the left side of the child's face. We also commonly see loop marks. Loop marks are patterned injuries that are left behind by belts, cords, electrical cords, wire coat hangers, basically any implement that is thin and flexible and able to be looped over on itself and used to whip a child. And it is the very high velocity impact that causes this characteristic U-shaped contusion. When we see loop marks, we often will see this U-shaped component and then oftentimes, if they are relatively new, we will see the double train track component as well. That is showing us the outline of the implement that was used to cause the injury. Here is another example of a loop mark. Again, you can see the U shape and you can also see the double train track appearance. Children cannot bump into or fall onto a rigid object and get a patterned injury. So when we see the stripe-like injuries of a slap mark or the U shape bruises that we see with a loop mark, we need to think strongly about the possibility of abuse. Accidental impacts with toys that have rounded edges will not cause these kinds of lesions. You now have a rule that you can apply whenever you see a bruise in a young child to help you decide whether or not to be concerned. One of the things that I think is helpful is to understand what normal bruising appears like in young children. Children, once they are mobile and playing and able to fall down developmentally, they start earning their bruises. They tend to bruise on the fronts of their bodies over what we call bony prominences. Bony prominences are the forehead, elbows, the knees and the shins especially get the brunt of it. So when we see bruises on children that are not on the front of the body or over bony prominences, that can be concerning. Another critical role all of us can play in our community to help protect children is to help ensure that all children have safe caregivers. A safe caregiver is someone who wants to take care of the child, who doesn't have a temper, who doesn't use drugs or alcohol, who is able to focus on the well-being of the child during the time they are in, char in charge of the child. Oftentimes, in severe physical abuse cases, it is a substitute caregiver who is the perpetrator of the abuse. Anything that we can do within our community to encourage young parents to ensure that they have safe caregivers for their children can be helpful. One other component of choosing safe caregivers for infants and young children is helping to make sure that those caregivers understand about infant crying. 
It turns out, probably not as a surprise to any of us, that crying is one of the most commonly cited reasons for child abuse. All babies cry, and lots of toddlers cry too. It's important for caregivers to know concrete techniques for how to soothe a crying infant, whether it's to rock them or to check to make sure they don't need their diaper changed or to be fed. But also, caregivers need to have the permission, if they're feeling frustrated, to put the baby down and walk away. Take a break, regroup, step away for a moment or two, and then go back and check on the baby. Crying never hurt a baby, but shaking will. Making sure that the caregivers who are taking care of babies and young children understand how to keep their cool and soothe themselves in addition to soothing the baby can be absolutely critical. Once we have encountered a child or a family in whom we have concerns about abuse, it's important to know how to make a report. As you've probably already heard, here in Kentucky, we are all mandatory reporters. That means that any of us living in this state who has a reasonable suspicion that abuse may be taking place are required by law to report that. We must report to either Child Protective Services or to our local police department. This is so important because in so many of our children who are victims of severe abuse, there have been neighbors, family members, other professionals who had concerns but simply never took the time to call in a report. When making a report to Child Protective Services about suspected maltreatment, it is important to give them objective information. This includes the date and time that you saw the incident, details about the location and the appearance of the bruises, information about how the family dynamic appeared if you were able to witness that. Sometimes when making a report to Child Protective Services, it can be helpful to have notes in front of us so that we remember to mention all of the specific concerns that we have. We have to understand that Child Protective Services makes the decision about whether or not to investigate a report based on the information that we give them. So the more concrete that information can be, the better. Here at the COSAIR Charities Division of Pediatric Forensic Medicine at the University of Louisville, we are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to help anyone who has a suspicion of abuse in a child understand what their next steps need to be. If you ever have any questions about how to make a report to Child Protective Services or what the most appropriate next step would be, you can call us at this number. Thank you for your time and attention today. It is so critical that all of us as a community come together and learn everything that we can do to help protect our children. That way we can face it and end it.